Hello and welcome to Cyber Focus, your source for international business information. My name is Tim Smith and our guest today is Professor Awi Mona. Professor Awi is a legal scholar dedicated to research and development of indigenous movements and legal systems. He specializes in international law, human rights law, indigenous law, and cultural protection. He received his PhD in law from the University of Washington, and he's a member of the Sedic people and is committed to developing national laws that advance the rights and interests of Taiwan's indigenous people. Today, Professor Aoi will share his insights on indigenous rights and how they tie into the Taiwanese legal system. Professor Aoi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Tim. So glad you're here and welcome to the Midwest. Uh, it's, uh, it's my honor to be here, yeah. Great, thanks. Well, to begin with, can you tell us about some of the key challenges indigenous people face? How has the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples been able to assist or shed light on these challenges? So, uh, I think the, the UN Declaration is uh, still a very new legal development internationally. So it just passed in 2007, it's uh, like a decade ago. So uh, to say uh, what's its influence on indigenous people's rights, I think is the kind of summarize uh, for the past half century's uh, international indigenous movement for, for our right to like fight or against the government. So that also have shed some of the support on our clans to indigenous people's rights in Taiwan. Uh, to say one example, let's say uh, in 2005, before the UN Declaration was passed, uh, actually we adopt a number of uh, key uh, components and content of the UN Declaration into our national legislation, which we have been enacted as the indigenous people's best law. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, the fact is, uh, the UN Declaration and also our Indigenous People's Basic Law is a highly advanced legal concept uh, compared to the, the Westernized states law systems. Let's say like uh, uh, we always claim that uh, Indigenous people have inherent sovereignty and also uh, we always can see uh, Indigenous people around the world always claim we have the right to Aboriginal title. So let's take these two examples. The, we, you, you won't see any like legal terms in state legal system because the, the only thing, the only entity who can claim sovereign is only the nation state. Okay. Yeah, and another thing is when we say title, it means the title to a property. Mm -hmm. It's not a title to a specific uh, like ethnic group as indigenous peoples. So even we adopt this into our national legislations uh, uh, since 2005, so already more than 10 years, uh, we still have a number of uh, different implementation bylaws mm -hmm. hasn't been enacted yet. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In 2016, Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen mm -hmm. delivered a national apology to the indigenous peoples. This laid out a scheme to restore the historical and transitional justice for indigenous rights. What effect has this had on the relationship between indigenous communities and the Taiwanese government? specifically when it comes to self-government. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I will start with the, how does this has the changed the relationship between the peoples of Taiwan as the Han people and the indigenous peoples. Uh, because the term we use to describe indigenous peoples as the Yuan Zhu Min Zhu. Mm. So that's the term when our first constitutional amendment taken place in 1997. So before 1997, the government of Republic of China used the term as a mountain people to describe the Yuan Zhu Minzu. Okay. And before the World War II, the Japanese government used 
the savage people describe Yuan Zhu Minzu. So the savage people has been used in the history of Taiwan more than 400 years. So that's impact the relationship between the Han people and Yuan Zhu Minzu because the savage people has a very like a serious uh, culturally dis discrimination against the indigenous peoples. So having said that, I think even now we constitutionally has been recognized as indigenous peoples, but in the general people's mind, they still a lot see us as the savage peoples. So I think the first thing we can, we, we can see the influence from the national apology developed by our president is to change this stereotype mm. has been embedded in our general society. I think that's for one. And another thing is uh, because the national apology uh, has signified two important like uh, two important meanings. Mm. One is that uh, right now the presidential office has already established a committee on historical justice and transitional justice for indigenous peoples. So we probably a lot of people have learned about the transitional justice, but a lot of people might not understand why do we have to, to do historical justice? Yeah, so by traditional justice, we refer to the, uh, a certain period of time, the government as the authoritarian regime. So we want to kind of uh, make it right. Mm -hmm. And then for the historical justice, I think we have to refer to the historical cultural discrimination against the indigenous peoples. So uh, based on this framework has already in place in Taiwan, I think uh, the, the very important uh, uh, idea is that uh, we not only has to change the relationship between the Han people and the indigenous people, by restoring the historical justice, we, we are claiming indigenous people as a legal subject, as a legal entity. Hmm. So to be a legal entity, then you have the right to be self-government. I think that that's the, the, the concept we can learn from the national policy hmm. for the general public. Thank you. Mm -hmm. To what extent have the indigenous customary laws been incorporated and implemented through the state's legal system? Okay. Uh, Actually, before, even before the Indigenous Peoples Law has passed in 2005, and in a number of different legislation has, been, has already incorporated indigenous cultural practices into different legislation, mm. like the hunting law, like the wildlife law. Because for the indigenous people, hunting, gathering, and fishing are the best cultural practice mm. as well as economic sustainability. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so not um, we don't expect the. I mean, we don't expect the administrative system of government to recognize our right, but the effective way and the effective advancement we, we, we have already seen in Taiwan is that the judicial system has already uh, in a number of different judgments to recognize indigenous people's customary law to practice like hunting, gathering, and fishing. Mm -hmm. And even a number of cases go up to the Supreme Court and to recognize we as an indigenous people have right to cultural practices based on our customary law, mm -hmm. even in some of the civil cases. And, and we can see a number of uh, civil cases regarding, regarding the, the inheritance. Mm -hmm. So indigenous people, based on their different family system, we might have different inheritance system. And that's already also been uh, discussed by, 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 by the court system of Taiwan. And right now, the most significant cases is pending in our constitutional court. So that's the above the Supreme Court. So that's not like the judicial system in the States. Mm. So we, above the Supreme Court of Taiwan, we still have a constitutional court. So every 
constitutional ma uh, matters has been resolved in constitutional level. So there is one case right now pending in the constitutional court regarding whether or not indigenous people's cultural practices for hunting include uh, like uh, self, uh, how to say it, uh, to use by our own, mm -hmm. not by the cultural practices. Yeah, that's yeah. a great segue to my next question. Mm -hmm. So hunting rights are of great importance to many indigenous people and communities. Can you explain the significance of these rights and how the state government bans on the hunting hurt indigenous communities? You shared with me a little bit about the law that's currently mm -hmm. pending. What will change if that law is passed, if anything? Okay, uh, I think the the state's law has to uh, the reason for the state's law to ban or to put on some more restriction mm -hmm. on indigenous hunting has to has a number of different like uh, purposes. Mm -hmm. For one, they want to control the firearms. Okay. Yeah. So I think that that's for one reason, and another reason is for the wildlife preservation. Yeah, Certainly. I think that's the two main reasons and purposes to uh, restrict our practices on hunting. But the thing is that uh, we always, like a uh, state law, always like uh, divide, uh, I mean, human beings apart from our nature. Mm. But in our in indigenous worldviews, actually human beings are connected with the natural system. We are not divided. We are not like a different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, um, also uh, we always say that uh, indigenous people have the right to be indigenous. Actually, in another term, everyone has a right to be yourself. Mm -hmm. Then how could you be yourself? I think th the, the answer is the, the answer can feed back to indigenous right. Indigenous people have the right to be indigenous, mm -hmm. which means how could you be yourself? You, have, you, you, you might refer to your cultural belief systems. Mm -hmm. you, might, you might refer to your lifestyle, or you might refer to anything you like. So indigenous people, how do we define ourselves? That's the, I think that's the actual content for us to understand the human dignity also to the indigenous peoples. Professor Aoi, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing this information with us. I wish you safe travels and come back to Bloomington again soon. Thank you, Tim. Thanks. That's all for this edition of Cyber Focus. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any comments or suggestions for future topics, please let us know at C-I-B-E-R, that's cyber at indiana.edu.